So, so glad that you're here today. Uh, let me pray and we'll jump in and study God's word together. Jesus, thank you for allowing us to be in the room. And I pray that you have words for us today that encourage us, inspire us, challenge us. And just to know we've been in your presence and, and heard from you will make all the difference. So if you're open to hearing from God this morning, I invite you to pray this simple prayer that we pray every week together as a church. If you're new, just a quiet prayer between you and God, something like this. Jesus, would you please speak to me today? Because I'm listening. And then would you uh, pray for someone else, maybe someone you came to church with today or seated beside, simple prayer for them, something like this. God, would you please talk to this person today? And would you give them the faith and the courage to respond to you? In Jesus' name, Everybody said, amen. Uh, We're in the middle of this series, a three-week series we started last week called Hope Has a Name, and it's around the Advent season. And and if you don't know, maybe you grew up in a tradition, a faith tradition that celebrated Advent where we took a Sunday during the Christmas season and we celebrated faith and hope and love and peace and and we kind of took each of those Sundays and focused on a particular characteristic. But the word Advent means expectation, an expectation of the arrival of something or someone. And there's not another season in our life like Christmas that, that brings up anticipation like the Christmas season, like Advent. We're waiting on something. And when you're a child, you just can't wait for it to get here. And when you're an adult, you think, I can't believe it's already here, right? Did you wake up yesterday or Friday morning and like, it's only two weeks, are we ready? That's you know our conversation. But as a kid, it seems like it'll never get here. But the, the season of Advent, it comes from uh, the people of God waiting on their Messiah. So for a few thousand years, the people of God were looking forward to Jesus. They were looking forward to a Messiah who would come and who would set things right who would pay for the sins of the people of God, who would lead them out of oppression and lead them into freedom. And so they were looking forward to that. And then they went into a period, the 400 year period of silence between the last pages of the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, into the New Testament, between 400 years between the last prophet of God speaking to the people of God about the Messiah of God to come, and 400 years of silence until the baby cries in the night and the angel proclaims, one has come, the Savior has come. He's been born in the city of David in Bethlehem, and he announces that to a group of shepherds and breaks that silence. But can you imagine? I mean, 400 years of no voice from God, no prophet, and trying to hold on to your faith, trying to hold on to these promises of God. So there's this period of waiting and this kind of collective people of God yearning for for this deliverance and freedom and this Messiah to come. And that's why when we come to Christmas, we're celebrating the expectation, this arrival of Jesus and anticipating the second coming of this Messiah, this Jesus who will set all things right. Because let's face it, thing, God is at work in the world, but things aren't as they should be. Things aren't as they should be in your life, in my life, in your home. Things aren't as they should be in our nation and in our world. And we look back with this hope and faith because God has come through in the past. And we look forward with this anticipation that God will set things, all things right uh, in the end. But in the meantime, we're waiting. We're waiting on God to do something. We're waiting on God to come through in our lives personally. But the problem is, we said this last week, is that we're all terrible waiters, Like nobody raises their hand and says, you know what I'm really great at? Waiting. I just love, I just love to wait. I just love to wait around. I just, it just, uh, you know? Have you ever been on a plane and you get there on time, you get there early, you go through security, you're like, man, I'm early. It's going really good. I mean, you're able to stop by the coffee shop, pick up a magazine, you're on time. You're like first in line. If you're doing Southwest, you're getting on. You jump down on that little cattle car they got called Southwest and you sit down in your little, you got a, me, I go aisle seat. Uh, I don't go window because I have longer legs. I want to stretch them out and get hit by that cart 30 times as it comes down the aisle. And you're, you're there, and then it feel, and then you, it's like a miracle of Jesus. It's the Christmas season that the middle seat is open. You ever, you ever have that? When you travel, it's like, this is so glory to God. And 
And so then you get ready to go. They crank the engines up, and then the pilot comes on and says, hey, you know, he tries to explain it to you. Hey, we're going to be a little bit delayed. You know, we've got an XLR three-piece, you know, switch that's broken, and we're going to have to have somebody fly in from Toledo to fix that. It'll be about an hour and a half. We're going to turn the air off so everybody's really comfortable. Like, do you ever have this? You're sitting on the tarmac, and you're like, we can't go back and, like, get a donut or anything. No, we're going to sit out here, no air conditioning. We'll wait on the guy from Toledo. And nobody in that moment goes, praise God. (laughs) Praise the sovereign God who runs the universe because he has given me an hour and a half to reflect on my life, right? He must have something important to say to me. And so I'm going to sit right, I can't, Lord, I can't wait to see what we're going to do. No, everybody's like on their phone. I'm going to be late. I can't believe this. We're all frustrated. This is collective because we hate to wait. And we're all looking forward to what we think is important, but we're all, we're all in the season of wait. All around this room, like everybody's waiting on something. And uh, in the middle of that, God is at work. Uh, there are people in this room who are waiting uh, on a child to come home. Like they're, they're wayward and they're making poor choices. And you've done everything like you've, you've, uh, you've talked to them till you're blue in the face. You've, you've done counseling. You've had their friends try to talk to them. But it just seems like they are hell-bent on going their way and doing their thing. And you see where all of that's leading. But now you're in this place of just holding on to God and saying, God, unless you speak to them, unless you draw them out of this path, I, I don't know what will happen. All right? you're, just, you're stuck there waiting on, on God to move. There are people in this room and will be in our house today that you're waiting on a spouse. Like they have a divided heart and they're going in a different direction. You might even be living in the same home, but they're pursuing something or someone else and you don't know if it's going to work out and you're kind of waiting on them to make up their mind. And you've done all the stuff. You've been to counseling. You've talked to them until you're blue in the face. You've had your friend talk to them. It's you're stuck there. You're, you're waiting on them. There's people in this room who are waiting on a job. Like even during the service, you'll be pulling out your phone, like refreshing the email, hoping that it comes through from that address, from that person. Like, I need this, God. And if you don't come through in this moment, in these places, then I, I don't know what we'll do. There's people in the room who are waiting on a breakthrough. There are people in the room who we said last week, you're waiting on a doctor. You're waiting on a result from a test or a scan, and, and you're hoping that maybe Wednesday that will come back, and they'll say to you, hey, it's okay or it's not okay, and here's the treatment plan for, every, for all those things that are coming, and, and we're, we're moving through these times, and it just seems like we're waiting, but God is not in a hurry. Has anybody felt like that? It just seems like that God is taking his sweet time and that maybe he doesn't even see me and he doesn't see what's happening in my life and what's going on in my personal world is not important to him. There are people in the room who are waiting on an adoption to work out and you fill out all the paperwork and you've gone through all the hoops and paid all the money and it's just stale and you're like, I, we've done all we can do and you're, you're in the wait People in the room who are waiting on their parents to work it out. We've got middle school and high school students and elementary students who are in the rooms meeting back in our children's and student area who are waiting on mom and dad to make a decision. Like, are they going to you know, are they going to stay together? Are they going to move out? Is is dad going to come back? Is mom going to work? To, and they're in the way, bouncing back and forth. But there's something ha- powerful that happens in the wait. There's something powerful that happens between when it begins and we don't know exactly when God is going to come through. And we wait. We wait on the next thing to materialize in our life. Some of you are waiting on me to uh, finish this list. You're like, I get it. We're all waiting. It's a good list. I get it. Could you get to the point? Like, because we don't like to wait. I know you got something you want to say. Could you move past the wait list to... Like the people, yeah. But even in that, like there's this tension of, yeah, yeah, come on. Like, yeah, we get it. We're waiters. Up and down your row, people are waiting on something. But in the middle of that, God 
is working. We talked about that last week. We hold on to that, that even while we're waiting and it seems like God is dragging his feet and when we cannot trace God's hand, we can trust his heart, that there is never a moment, never a second of the day where God is not working on your behalf for his glory and our good. And Christmas is this annual shouting reminder that God will come through. Every time we come to this season, it it reminds us that even in the wait, God is at work. Even when we think God is just not in a hurry, God is at work. But in, um, so here's, here's the rub is that in, in, in our culture and, and maybe every people groups around the world is that what we're really concerned about is not later, but right now. What we're really concerned about with is not, hey, what's coming down the pipe, but right now. We, we're concerned with how I feel in this moment and how can I get what I want when I want it, right? I and mean, that's what most of our days are consumed with. How do I feel and how do I get what I want when I want right now when I want it? How fast can I get that? But God just doesn't seem to operate that way, that he's got bigger things in mind for you and bigger things in mind for me, that he's at work on a bigger project than what I feel or what I think I need right now at this moment. Because here's my experience is what I think I need right now at this moment is probably what I need right now in this moment. It's probably not what I need long term because God's at work in bigger ways for you and your family and your world than what you're dreaming of in this moment. Maybe here's a good way to describe this is uh, I know we have a few parents in the room, but uh, a few Christmases ago, this little lady right here showed up uh, at our house. Does, does, anybody, does anybody know what an American Girl doll is? Does anybody know this? This is, this is Lucy right here, okay, guys? And uh, if you have a young daughter and you're a father in the room, this should terrify you, all right? just want you to know that. Uh, because this is a this is a racket industry, uh, but I, I digress. I'm going to pull back. Okay, I'm not going to go off on a tangent. But this is Lucy. Lucy arrived a few Christmases ago. We could not wait for Lucy to come. Lucy uh, was an American girl, beautiful, named her, took her everywhere. There's a Lucy store, uh, an American Girl doll store at, at Park Meadows, and uh, it's a it's a scary place. Um, and you, you go in there, and there's a bunch of excited moms, happy daughters, and nervous dads, like like holding their wallet because Lucy is she is, she is more expensive than my daughter. Um, so we had all kind of clothes. I'm gonna see if Lucy will sit. She probably. I'm just gonna let Lucy. And then she. she one time, my daughter brushed Lucy's hair so much that it all fell out, and we had to uh, we had to send her to Lucy Hospital. And uh, no kidding. Not kidding. Came back in a box, a little hospital gown. So this, this, this is. I mean, this this is one of about three boxes we have. Okay, um, this is like a little look at look look at Lucy's suitcase, guys. Do you know why we had to get Lucy's suitcase? Does anybody know? Because we're going on a what, ladies? We're going on a trip, all right? And we got our suitcase. My little daughter Maddie, who's now 12, almost 13, she had her suitcase, and Lucy had to have her her purple suitcase. Lucy had a shower. These are these are bubbles from the bubble bath. Uh, I don't. I can't even get into that because I'll have a panic attack. Um, <laughs> boxes of this stuff. And so I was thinking about this last night when I was thinking about, you know, it's so easy to talk about that with our kids. We want what we want when we want. We had a long list from American Girl Doll Store. Here's what we want. We have boxes of this stuff. We could finance a small African nation with the money that we have spent on American Girl Doll. And I was thinking about this, and I walked into my little girl's room last night. I said, hey, where's your American Girl Doll? I want to use it for a little illustration tomorrow. It's, where is it, ladies? It's in the basement in a box, right? What, man, we were just dying. We had to have it, and we had to have the travel package and the spa package. And listen, we actually went and got to the hair salon and got Lucy's hair done at America. This is weird, guys. I'm telling you, you've never been in this world. It's crazy and expensive. And, um, but that's where Lucy lives now like in a box in our basement. 
And uh, so I, I thought, you know, it's so easy to see that with kids. But in our own lives, right, don't, I need this right now. God, God, are you listening to me? Like, I need this right now. And the things that we want so bad, because we're never satisfied by the things that we own, the things that we want so bad in our lives, so many times within a few months or years, they just go into the box, right? They're just like, that's not, it's not as important as I thought it would be. And in the wait, like God is doing something, but he sees beyond that. He sees beyond what we're dying to have right now and says, you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to make a people. I'm trying to craft you. I'm trying to create something in you where you have done something bigger with your life than what you think you can even imagine. Like that I want to do something in you where you become a person who knows me and loves me and follows me because that was what will matter in the end. So I want us to turn to a text we're going to read briefly uh, this morning. It's a really familiar, famous Christmas text in Exodus chapter 13. Not really, that's a joke because Christmas doesn't happen for a lot of a lot more books later. But Exodus chapter 13. We're going to read some verses together about the people of God when they're in the wait, like when, they, when they're waiting on God to come through. So if you brought your Bibles and you want to turn there, you can. If not, the verses will be on the screen. Just setting it up, the people of God have been in captivity for 400 years to Egyptian slave masters. And so you know most of this story probably. God has sent a deliverer, Moses. God delivers his people as it, through his spokesperson, Moses, uh, in Egypt. And the Pharaoh has set them free, and now they are leaving the Egyptian empire and going to what God describes as the promised land. Now the Bible says this is two million people. And sometimes we get our concept around that, and we're like, okay, two million people. Now imagine the entire city of Denver leaves. Like, that's a lot of people, right? You know, it's everything that you can carry with you. It's your children, it's your grandma, it's all your cattle. You're, you le- you're leaving Denver and heading south. We're going to read a few verses here, and then we're just going to ask ourselves, what does this have to say about the season of wait that we're in? Verse number 17 of chapter 13. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. And the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. And he said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. After you leave Succoth, they, uh, after they, leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By the day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way by night and a pillar of fire to guide them with light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So let's just walk through that together for just a moment of what this might teach us. And honestly, these aren't really super popular ideas, but they are true, is that in the wait. God is at work, and God is not in a hurry, but God has something specific in mind for you personally and for his people. The first thing we read in this verse is that after the Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. So here's the idea. This group of people, two million people, are headed somewhere. They're going to a promised land, a land where they can thrive and flourish as the people of God. And it says, most scholars believe, that if they had traveled a certain path, this two million people could have arrived in the promised land within 10 days to two weeks. But we know from what the scripture tells us that it took them decades to reach the promised land. It says here explicitly that God did not lead them that way, the way that was shorter. Because, listen, here's the point today, is that some God, sometimes God takes us the long way. Sometimes God takes us the long way around. 
because he has to teach us something. We have to become something on that journey. It says very explicitly that he does not take them on the short road, but he leads them down a certain path. The next verse says that he leads them by this desert road toward the Red Sea. Not only does he not lead them by the shortest route possible, he leads them to a place that could be described as a dead end. So if you're devising an escape plan for a group of people, you want to go the shortest route possible, right? But God says, no, I'm going to take you by a path that's going to teach you the most. We're going by the desert road, and we're headed to the Red Sea. Now, why does God do this? Because he's trying to teach them something about who he is. He's trying to develop a group of people who know and understand and follow their God. He's trying to teach them that he is sufficient no matter what the circumstances are going on. Now imagine this. You're two million people. You're roaming around. If you can imagine, our church is about a 1,000 people who regularly attend here, and sometimes people complain. Can you believe that in a church like this? In a church, people murmur, and they complain. They're like, why are we doing this, or why are we doing that? Imagine 2 million people escaping from slavery and headed in the wrong direction. Like, can you imagine, like, the gospel? Hey, somebody's get up there and talk to Moses. I don't think he knows where we're going. Like, we're going down the desert road, and we're headed to the Red Sea. Now, sometimes when we think about the Red Sea, we think about, oh, that's a little river. They crawl a stream. They all want to crawl. No, it's like standing in front of the Pacific Ocean. It's like saying, hey, we want to go to Omaha, and you're all walking towards San Diego. Like, no, we're not going to get there this way, Moses. But God has something in mind. Like, he's taking them the long way around to describe to them, to show them, so that they experience that God is sufficient no matter what their circumstances, and, and they wait. And then he says to them, why? He says, if we go straight there, you won't be ready. He says, when we get there, the Philistines will be ready, and they are there, and they are a soldiering, warring people, and you've been making bricks for 400 years. Like, you're all dressed for battle, but you're not ready to fight this war. And so I'm going to take you away so that you understand, you can develop, you can see who I am. And we know the rest of the story, most of us, right? He comes up to this massive sea, and we know that Pharaoh changes his mind and sends out the largest army in the world at that time to come and to bring back the slaves. And then what happens is that the Bible describes that God says to his people, now stand still and watch. Stand and watch. And so they, they, they do nothing but trust in God in the moment, in the wait, in the circumstances. And God says, watch me work. And then an angel that they did not know was there came around from in front of them and stood between them and the pursuing army and stood and separated them and protected them while God was preparing them in the night. And then the next morning, Moses steps forward and says, what now? And then he touches his staff because God tells him to the water. And then the sea parts. I mean, walls of water, 20, 30, 40 feet. Imagine pressing back that much water so 2 million people can walk through. And the Bible says, for the sake of time, they walk through on dry land, right? They walk through as a group of people, and they get to the other side. And then as the pursuing army chases them into the water, the sea crashes on them and drowns most of them. Now, listen, just a simple question uh, is this a different group of people on the other side of the Red Sea? Is this a different group of people now? Yes. Like they have seen something they will never forget. We're all sitting in the room talking about it today. God allowed them to become someone, someone different by experiencing that moment. And when you're in the wait, when, you're, when God is saying, I will come through, and it seems like this is a long way around, God. I know because I've got bigger ideas for you. I've got bigger plans for you. And I want, my, my goal for you is not necessarily how you feel. And my goal for you is not necessarily you get exactly what you want when you want it. My goal for you is that you become a people of God who know me and glorify me with your lives. And so this is a group of people standing on the other bank of the Red Sea. And now they know no matter what we face, our God is with us. Our God is sufficient. 
And how many of you have been through a season of wait? Like your greatest stories, your greatest songs of hope are, are stories of the wait, where you came through and your story that you tell is when, when there was no hope, when I didn't know what to do, when, I didn't see, when it seemed darkest, my God came through. And then something happens on the inside of you, right? Like how many of you know, if you've never been through something like this, you've experienced, uh, you, you've, you have experience with someone like this, that you're, you look at that person, you go, with all you've been through, how can you be so strong? Like, how could you have such a faith? How, how could you be so secure in God because they could tell their story of the dark night of the soul when they walked through the sea and it was like, and God came through and God was there in the wait. God is at work. When we're longing to get through to the other side, God is saying to us in this, I'm trying to teach you something about me. The last thing is that God is trying to convince us as a people that while we're waiting, God is working, and that we're not just waiting on God. We're waiting with God. Now, I know this is like a really simple idea, but we're not just waiting on God to come through. Well, I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs, and I'm just, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just waiting. Hopefully, God will show up. We're not just waiting on God. We're waiting with God, and in the moment, God is with us. The second part of this verse says that there was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night so that God's presence would be known and with them in these dark moments of waiting. You just follow the cloud. You just follow the pillar, pillar, pillar of fire by night and remember that I am with you in the wait. So what that means is if you're going to the doctor's appointment this, this week, Jesus is going with you. And you're waiting on the result. Jesus is waiting with you. It, what that means, if you're waiting on a judge to make a decision about something that's happening in your family, listen, Jesus is waiting with you. That God's presence is enough in those moments. That God is going to come through and be sufficient, but to remind ourselves over and over again that even in the wait, while I'm waiting, I'm waiting with God. And that's not too bad. And that the waiting is not wasted because I'm waiting with God. There's this collective, like together, you know what, We're, we are in the wait and we don't want to ignore that, but God is with us in this moment. So I've sat around some hospital rooms, I've prayed with families and parents about different things that are happening, and we pray a lot of things, but we pray in those moments, God, be with us in this place. And then sometimes there's no answer, there's no answer, but we walk out with this comfort of the presence of God in our lives. And when we come to Christmas, there's this, we all come together going, you know what, we're, we're all waiting on something together, and we could all go up and down the row and go, here's, here's what we're waiting on, here's what my family's waiting on, but we're going to remind ourselves and confess that, that we're waiting with God, and, and we can share that experience together. So uh, to close today, um, I don't share this with a lot of people, but uh, I am a, I'm a Closet Adele fan. I stink and love Adele, all right? My wife's like, this is weird. I'm like, uh, but I, I love some Adele now. And um, so I, I, her new album just came out. I'm listening to it, you know. And, and so I, I get online. I'm watching some Adele video music, something, because it clicked from one thing to the next because she was on Jimmy Fallon, and then it goes to the next thing on YouTube. And I'm watching this, uh, this concert, and she's, uh, she's singing the Royal Albert Theater in London. Uh, it's live. And I, I'm just listening to it. I watched the whole thing a couple of times. She starts telling the story of the song, Someone Like You. Like, this girl's always sad, right? She's writing, she's writing some sad breakup songs. And, but it's made her a lot of money. And so, you can, yeah. So, uh, anyway. So, she starts to tell the story of the song. And uh, it's midway through the the concert, and as you can see from this picture, like what amazes me about this is like this is her and a piano and about 10,000 people, right? Piano, she's taking her shoes off, she's getting comfortable because she's Adele, and hey, I don't care what you think. 
And uh, she starts to sing this song, Someone Like You. And almost every, and even if you act like you don't know it, you know it. Everybody knows someone like you. And um, so she starts to sing this song, and, and she's just going for it. And it's, it's amazing because her voice is amazing. And, uh, and it's just a piano, and it's simple. And, and then about two minutes and 50 seconds into the song, she takes the microphone, and she turns it out, and she says... Uh, in her thick British accent, would you sing this with me, Royal Albert? And everyone in the audience starts to sing the song. I mean, there's, t- I mean, 10,000 people, and there, she's not singing. They're singing at the top of their lungs this song, and it starts to pan the audience, which, by the way, this is another time and moment, but people lift their hands, people clap, people stand, people cry. It's a moment of worship. Right, And sometimes we come to church and go, that's so weird that people would lift their hands or stand or sing or be emotional. Listen, that's a human response, not a church response. And so they, they start to sing and they just pan the audience and everyone is just singing their lungs out to this song. And then you see these couples, they start to turn to each other, singing the song to each other. I'm like, this is hilarious. And, um, and then she comes back in with her power you know, vocal and sings the rest of the song. It's like this emotional moment. Everybody's like just laughing, just you know, clapping. Uh, and here's what I thought when I got to the end of, of that is like for, for the people in that room singing that song, like that was a collective experience. Like it was like I've had this breakup or I fell fat before and I've heard all these. And it was an emotional moment. They were reminding each other of this song. They had this collective experience together. Uh, but as the people of God, we come together on regular days like these days, like Sunday mornings, um, and we come to this Advent season, and sometimes when we gather together, we have a collective experience in waiting on something, and, and, and waiting on God to come through, waiting on God. He, he is our only hope, and we come together and we say, I, I need you, God, come, God, come. So we're, the band's going to come now, and we're going to sing one last song. We're not going to receive communion together today. Communion will be available at the end of the service if you'd like to come and, and take that before you leave. Because I want us to have a moment where we stop and we sing a song together and we reflect and we have this common experience just for a moment. Because when you come to the Christmas season, sometimes you hear a song in the background I mean, it's playing everywhere. And you've heard this song over and over and over and over again. You can probably sing the, at least the first line of this song. But this song is written out of this groaning, like out of this collective, ah, God, please come. Please, if you don't come, I don't know what I'm going to do in this moment. And I've come to this place, and it seems like you're taking me the long way around. I know you're trying to teach me something, but God, would you please come through? So the song, this is the first lines of the song. It just says, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. That's what we've been talking about today, right? Come, God, be with us. Come, God, be with us. And ransom captive Israel. God, we're trapped in this circumstance, and we need you to come through. That mourns in lonely exile here. Until the Son of God appears. And then it gets to this line. And you've heard it. I mean, you've heard it on choirs. You've heard people do it in symphonies. You've heard people do bad solos in church. They sing, rejoice, rejoice. Right? I mean, imagine that moment. Like, together, singing that Emmanuel has come to the God with us has come this morning. So, I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're waiting on. I don't know what you're hoping for. But I think all of us collectively are for something. And so the band's going to sing this song, and you can sing along if you'd like, but I'd like for us to stay seated for just a moment and just think about the words of this song and in a collective moment of saying to God, it, come, Emmanuel, be with me in this moment, or I don't know what I'll do right? You're taking me the long way around, it seems like, God. But I know that while I'm waiting, you're working. And I also know while I'm waiting, I'm waiting with you. So Lord, uh, as we sing this song uh, together and to you, just let it be our, our heart to say, 
God, please be with me in this circumstance and in this moment. In Jesus' name.